So welcome everybody to today's lecture. My name is Jens Dietrich and today we will be talking about storage. As I showed to you last time already, those are the planned questions and techniques we will be covering in this core lecture database systems. And today's topic will be how to move big or small or whatever data through a computer system. So we will have the, we have the following learning objectives. So we basically look at storage the storage hierarchy, including specific hardware that is available in the storage hierarchy. I'll talk a little bit about replication, caching, buffering, and the read and write strategies that are available. For questions, again, let me remind you, we have this Frag Jetzt tool available. So maybe you scan it with your smartphone. There's a moderated chat, and my tutor in chief, Christian Schön, is sitting in the background, um, and he will <coughs> be pushing those questions to me and uh, then every now and then I will be answering those questions. Okay, with that, let's start. So what is storage all about and the storage hierarchy? So this is the dream you have basically. Yeah? That's how storage should look like. Basically you have a, a little card, yeah? basically it doesn't take <laughs> any space, uh, you have whatever, 42 yottabytes, that's 10 to the power of 24 bytes. You have a read performance of 800 zettabytes, maybe like, like nothing, whatever you read, all your data is just like bam, bam, bam. There's no delay whatsoever for reading data and the same holds for writing the data. And then that should be like for free, like zero euros. Well, that, that's a dream, of course. Reality is more something like that. <clears throat> well, you can get like a terabyte on these um, SD cards. Read performance, if it's a very good one, maybe around one gigabyte. Write performance also for a very good one, maybe around 500 megabytes. And the price, maybe 200 euros. That depends a lot on the performance characteristics, not only the size. Yeah? So many of those um, SD cards vary in price because, for instance, the write performance differs a lot. Yeah? But that's basically what you have. So there's memory is not unlimited and the performance of memory is not unlimited. And that's a major observation when looking at uh, memory. So basically, here's again in text what we would like to have. So that's the properties, unlimited capacity, instant random access. So no, no, no matter where, so which address on that device I'm addressing, it should be instant uh, without any delay unlimited bandwidth for sequential access so I can stream as much data per second as I want. It should be for free and it should be persistent. Yeah? So it shouldn't decay. Yeah? It shouldn't break at any point in time if I keep it in a drawer for like 10 years. All data should still be accessible. Well, and uh, as all of this doesn't work, as there is no such thing as perfect memory, well, the idea is to make a compromise and that's a storage hierarchy. And I hope some of you have seen that already in some undergrad lecture, but the basic idea is something like that. So basically here you have the computing course with, with registers. Yeah, so in, in order to do any computation in a modern computer system, you have to load the data into the registers. Yeah? And only if it's in the registers, you can do the actual computation. And uh, basically we can observe the following trade-offs here, or maybe let's first uh, concentrate on the middle here. And what you see here is you have different layers, memory layers that have different properties. So here you see L1, L2, L3, those are three different types of caches you can observe in many computer systems. So some systems also have an L4 cache. Then you have what we call main memory, that's typically DRAM. And then you have some persistent device. It could be a hard disk or an SSD, a flash drive. Um, we will go into that in, in more detail. But the basic trade-off, the basic idea here is that you have much smaller, faster memories closer to the actual computing core, to the, to the CPU. So um, actually uh, those memories are very expensive per byte and you try to have only small memories of that and you place them very close to the CPU and the further you go out, the cheaper the memory becomes and the bigger the memory becomes. So you have a fast and expensive L1 cache close to the CPU. This L2 is a little slower, a, bit, a little bigger, 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 bigger. The further you go out, the bigger it gets, the slower it gets. And that's a compromise, that's which is called the storage hierarchy. But that compromise um, 
turns out to be very, very successful and very, very, it's a, it's a sweet spot when you look at the price and the performance at the same time. And you have to look at price and performance at the same time because you can't get the perfect performance that would be um, infeasible in terms of money. It's not possible. Huh? Yeah, and uh, here's some typical access times are depicted. That those change uh, every year. There, there are some new numbers you could put in, but the basic, um, ba basic um, distances or, or timings um, are still preserved. And what you see is basically when, when fetching data from a register, that it's like one cycle in the CPU, but the further the data is away, the longer it takes to get the data into the registers. So in the following, we will look at different scenarios. Basically, it's always like, okay, we, we have to do something with the data. Where does the data reside in the memory hierarchy, in the storage hierarchy? Memory hierarchy, storage hierarchy is, are synonyms. Huh? It's the same thing. So where in that storage hierarchy is the data, how long does it take to load this stuff into the, the actual registers, into the, into the machine to do some meaningful computation? And you see here, uh, what you see here are the access times or the waiting times. So, so here it's just one cycle to fetch stuff from the registers. It's four cycles to fetch it from L1, 10 cycles from L2, 60 cycles from L3. This may vary a little bit, maybe a little more or less, depending on your concrete machine, but that's a ballpark. But then it gets tough when you go when the data is uh, not available in any of those caches and you have to really go to main memory, then you have to wait 60 nanoseconds. You may think, oh, 60 nanoseconds, well, that's beyond human perception uh, anyway. It's pretty fast. But that's just for one axis. And if you have millions and billions of accesses in a machine, in a computer program, th those um, latencies, those access times may assemble pretty quickly. It may slow down your machine. You know? And it gets really pretty, pretty, pretty wild and, uh, and um, a problem when, when the data is only available on hard disk or on, on, on an SSD drive. Yeah, if it's a hard disk, you're in the area of five milliseconds for flash drive and maybe 0 0.1 milliseconds, we will get into that. But that's a long time. That's a very long time from the point of view of a CPU if it has to do, if it has to wait all that time to get the data to do some meaningful work. Yeah. So that is something we have to keep in mind. And I tried to, um, I tried to provide an analogy here, uh, what that really means. Yeah. So because if you look at this, this, this graphic has many, many problems. So it's a schematic graphic trying to illustrate the, the trade-off. And you see that in many textbooks, but it's very, very misleading. And in the following, I will spend a few minutes on explaining why that is misleading. And one is the distances among the different layers. So when you look at um, the, the graphics here, you see, okay, that looks like it's the same distance, right? Visually, it's the same distance, but here you already see the huge gap, right? Here we're switching from nanoseconds to microseconds. Nanoseconds, well then the next would be microseconds, millions of a second, and then we are at milliseconds, uh, thousands of a second. Yeah? So many, many orders of magnitude uh, we jump over, but, but here um, it's still visually the same distance. Yeah? And that, that's the problem of this textbook visual, visualization. So to make it a bit clearer to you what this really means and, and how the distances look like in a computer system, um, let's look at the following uh, analogy. I basically just um, multiplied all of these distances by a constant to make it more tangible for, for us humans. So if you assume that a one cache, yeah, if data is in your a one cache, that that's a, corresponds to grabbing a piece of paper from your desk. Yeah, if, I, if I pick up anything from, from my desk, uh, that's about two seconds, and then I have that information in my hands. L2 cache already is picking up a book from a nearby shelf. That's five seconds. So like here, I have to go down around the shelf, right? And I uh, hopefully uh, pick a book and many things fall down, of course, if you do that, right? And then I see, oh, here's the book. That's five, like five seconds, yeah. Okay. What about L3 cache? That's already a little, a bit further. That's picking up a book from the next room. I'm not gonna do that now, don't worry. Yeah, so, but that's like 30 seconds. I have to walk out of the room, pick up the book, go back 30 seconds. What about DRAM? DRAM is walking, is taking a walk down the hall to buy a Twix bar. Yeah? Down the hall, down the entire aisle, 90 seconds, then I'm back. That's the real distance, if I translate that. And then the interesting thing happens if you think about, okay, how long does it take? Okay, if it's not in DRAM, I have to fetch it from, 
es ist vom Harddisk, in this example it's a hard disk. How long does that take? How long is the walk? And if you think about that, and if you didn't uh, peep already at my slides, just think about for yourself, how long do you expect it? Yes, if I have to fetch in this analogy, sticking to this analogy, how long does it take to fetch stuff from a hard disk? A disk with spinning platters, yeah, mechanical hard disk. How long does it take in this analogy? Well, the interesting thing is you can do the math and then you end up, it's like uh, walking from Saarland to Hawaii. Yeah, it's 7.5 million seconds of walking or 86.8 days. That is the analogy and that, that, that illustrates that um, in this graph, yeah, it looks, this is also like, yeah, it, you're always at the same equidistance uh, next is all, they all, you all have, you have the same step size in between the layers. It's not true. There's a huge cliff, a huge distance in particular between those caches and main memory and main memory and hard disk or even an SSD. We will get to that. Yeah. I hope this analogy helps to illustrate a little bit. And a different problem, a second problem with the visualization, the textbook visualization is that the typical sizes you have here, depicted them here, that's for one concrete machine. And of course, things get bigger every year, more memory gets added because prices go down. So for instance, main memory, 60 gigabytes, it's more like standard. You can make machines arbitrarily big. You have servers with terabytes of main memory, of course, uh, and hard disks can be pretty big, like a dozen, uh, dozen uh, terabytes is no problem. Eh? But, but, but um, the ratios, are more or less the same. And that's another trick of or another pitfall of this visualization. If you, if you in your mind think, okay, the area kind of corresponds to the size of the layer. Yeah? If you do that, then you fell into the ne next uh, trap because actually, if you try to visualize the different areas, it, areas, it more looks like this. Yeah? So you see, so here I have um, the area corresponds to the size. And if L1 is this size, L2 is this size, L3 is this size. And DRAM is actually also the, a disk, but you don't see it. You only see the, the horizon. And we have to zoom out a little bit to actually see the effect. Yeah, That's basically the size of DRAM in this world. Yeah? That is... Um, that will be a visualization that preserves relative sizes. Yeah? So um, when thinking about storage hierarchy, please think about these relative sizes and distances. Uh, it's not this, uh, what, you, what you see in textbooks. Okay, yeah, with that, we get to the tasks of each layer. Let me briefly check, frag jetzt. Um, there's a question about the last class, well, that's really, if you don't mind, can consistency, uh, let me briefly do this one. Question about the last class, if you don't mind, can consistency in asset properties be understood as accuracy of data transactions? No, no, consistency has a um, pretty clear definition. We have that in our under undergrad, or look it up in the textbooks. Uh, that's, uh, I don't think it's relevant to what we do here, sorry. Okay, so let's go back to the storage layer. We have these different layers. And another phenomenon you will see is often they're treated pretty independently. Even though from a 10,000 feet perspective or even a 1,000 feet perspective, if you wish, they all have kind of the same tasks, the same things they have to do. So basically when the request comes in from, from the CPU, any storage layer has to be able to localize the data object. Yeah? You have a request, hey, give me data object 42. Do you have it? And then the layer has to be able to respond, yeah, I have it, here, here, here it is. Or it has to say, no, I don't have it, sorry, ask the next uh, layer un underneath myself, right? That, that's the same task on each and every layer. Then there's caching, of course, going on. So maybe if you uh, go back to this, this, if you have any data item that is uh, sitting on hard disk, and, and then you load it into one of the other layers. Assume you load some data item from main memory, uh, from, from hard disk to main memory. You basically create a copy on the storage layer. Yeah? When you load it, you typically don't delete it from disk. You load it into main memory. Whenever you do a load a file, you do that. Yeah? If you load a file into main memory, now you have a copy of that file in main memory. And that doesn't mean that you delete it from disk typically. You can do that, of course, yeah? but typically that's not done. 
And this property is called inclusion. In that sense, whatever you have in this layer is completely available in that layer as well. Yes, yeah? so if you go from um, top to bottom, yeah, L1, whatever you have in L1 is completely contained in L2, is completely contained in L3 and so forth. So that's called the inclusion property. And you can break that if you wish, but um, often you can observe that property. Yeah? Then the other is data replacement strategies. As the layers have only a certain capacity, a certain size, and you, it may happen that if you want to load a new data item into that layer, you first have to make room for that new data item. We will go into that, but it basically means, okay, some stuff has to go out. You have to throw it out of the layer. What are you going to throw out of that layer? Then another task here is writing of modified data. Um, which basically means, okay, now once, maybe we can also go back to the visual to explain that a little easier. So assume you changed something in the register, you changed the data item, whatever, you cr increase the number of students from 42 to 43. Well, you changed it here, fine, but you, you didn't change it in any of the copies down here. Yeah, so assume the inclusion property is fully capped, which means if um, assume you have an integer value uh, reflecting the number of students, uh, and that is 42. So assume that sits on disk. So before being able to work on that item, you first load it through all of the storage layers. Basically, you create copies in all of the storage layers. Eventually, it's in the register. You modify it, increase it to 43, 43 and then, well, you have to push it back. You have to push it down the storage hierarchy. And the question is, when do you do that? You know, there are many, many uh, strategies you can do. But the worst is definitely to push it down completely when writing, yeah? because then you have to wait um, for the hard disk to, to write it to disk. Huh? You wouldn't want to do that. So those are the four strategies. Localization, finding stuff, caching of stuff, replacing stuff uh, if, if no room is available for new items, and writing modified data, how to write out data. Not, not to write it, only write it later, write it immediately, things like that. And in the, in the previous iteration of this course, I tried to really write that as a pattern inspired by um, the Gang of Four Design Patterns book in software engineering. Uh, it's an awesome book if you don't know it. Read it, Design Patterns by Gamma et al. It's fantastic to understand, understand software architectures. And we have similar patterns in database technology. And here, what you can, uh, can observe in the storage hierarchy is something like the all layers are similar. All these storage layers are somehow similar in how the tasks they have, how they behave. And eventually, you will see also in the algorithms and techniques they use to accomplish those tasks. And that's very important to keep that in mind. You shouldn't have the mindset to say, well, it's DRAM. That's so completely different from what a hard disk does, or it's a flash disk. It's completely different from what uh, L3 does. Yeah, on the detailed level, but on a high level, it's all the same th things. Yeah? And many algorithms that um, were developed for, say, hard disks can easily be um, adapted to SSDs or any other new storage medium that comes in, yeah? if you understand this commonality, yeah? if you understand it's more or less the same task. You can easily adjust existing algorithms to make them work with new storage media. Yeah? So whatever medium will come up in the future, the first thing you should do, if you want when you integrate it into, into your architecture, yeah, the first thing you should do is think about how can I adapt the existing algorithms? Because in most cases, it's, it's relatively easy. There's no need to invent new algorithms. So. Yeah, with that, let's look at read and write strategies and Caching. So what is reading in that word? I already mentioned the example, reading a file. Yeah, you read a file. Let's look at those two layers. You read a file, which means you create a copy in main memory. Yeah? And then whatever portion is touched by your computer program, by the CPU, parts of that main memory copy will be loaded into L3, L2, L1, or in some of the registers. Yeah? That's, that's what happens. Writing. So reading is from bottom to top and, and towards the CPU. Writing is from the CPU, from the cores, from the CPU cores, away, yeah? basically in direction to hard disk. Yeah? And no one forces you to write completely through to hard disk. You can only write it to L2, L3, 
and memory, blah, 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 whatsoever. Yeah? This is, um, all kinds of things are possible. But the principle is this. Uh, reading is yeah, loading it towards the CPU and writing is pushing it down again, pushing the changed values down again towards um, yeah, the, 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 the slow um, storage layers. And of course, if you read something and you didn't modify it, there's no need to write it back again. That's clear because it's only a copy. If you read this 42 value, you don't touch it in your CPU. There's no need to write it back to any other layer because those layers following the inclusion property already have a copy. You can basically throw it away. Just writing is something you should think about. Um, there's a question in the multi-course and it might happen that the copy... Uh, yeah, we will look at that. I will postpone that. There's a question about multi-core technologies. I will um, um, look at that later on. There's a question about L1 and L2. What L1 and L2? L L1 and L2 are the caches of the CPU. So I assume here that you uh, attended some undergrad bachelor course on hardware. So the basic architecture of a computer machine, um, of a computer. So we have two different courses here at Saarland University, basically. Um, I think it's handled partially in uh, programming too, but also in system architecture, uh, that's what is handled. So basically, it's a small cache. Yeah? If you have never seen that, consider it a small piece of memory that sits on the, on the same um, die, on the, that's basically inside the CPU. It's a small piece of fast memory. And they, they have different layers inside the CPU. Yeah, so other than the registers, which are directly, which are super close to the CPU, uh, to the computing core, you have L1, L2, and L3 caches that can keep some memory of certain sizes. Those are caches inside the CPU. And then if you go further out, there are other uh, main memories. Yeah? So uh, um, maybe um, if you have never seen that, um, Google it and you find uh, quickly uh, that information about that. Okay, here we go. All right, so, yeah, so back to writing and reading data. So uh, a couple of important things here <clears throat> to note. Uh, so this looks uniform, kind of, there, there are important differences because all this area here from main memory to the CPU, you don't have to worry about. That's all managed by, by the machine, by the operating system. You don't have to worry about that, yeah whether stuff gets loaded into L3, L2, L1, or whatever, you don't have to do that actively in the CPU architecture. In the GPU architecture, the graphics card, that's a bit different. There you have also, um, that's possible to, to load data actively into some of the caches. And here that's not, uh, in the CPU, you, you typically don't do that. So here's a boundary you can identify. From main memory up to core, everything is handled transparently and automatically by, by your hardware. But then there's a gap. So when you load stuff into main memory, you typically do that actively, yeah? like loading a file. And in a database system, um, how loading actually works is uh, through a software, software component that's called the database buffer. So the database buffer will load certain pieces of data from flash and hard disk and put put that data into main memory. Yeah, and certain actions have to be performed. We will go into detail, but basically that's a software component handling that. Huh? Operating systems can do similar things, but here we're talking about database systems. Okay, and what a database system does is it has a couple of methods. And maybe before going into that, in the following, I will always assume that the data we handle on, on a hard disk or on an SSD, on this medium is paginated, which means it's broken into chunks of a certain size that has historic reasons, but um, it's also still the unit of access you have on certain devices. For instance, on a, on a hard disk, you can't just read a single byte. You always read a multiple of a so-called um, hard disk page or sector, typically 512 bytes or something larger. So typically, we will 
be talking about pages in this course. And a page is something like four kilobytes of data or eight kilobytes of data. You can define that in many systems, but it's not just a single byte. Well, it's basically a page of information. Historically, the page uh, of information was called, uh, was inspired by like pages, text pages. Yeah? A text page, page has a certain capacity for characters, for, for bytes, if you wish. Yeah? And that was set to a certain amount and that's the unit of trans transfer we will be talking about in this course. Yeah. So the database buffer, it, the database buffer's job is to load and unload pages of data in between my memory and hard disk. And then from my memory, again, everything is transparent. So basically, once the system understands that some data is missing, it will eventually ask the database buffer and the database buffer is um, responsible for loading stuff. Okay, so let's look at that. So this database buffer has a couple of methods that are important to understand. Um, so basically by PX, I mean a reference to a particular page. So um, if you develop a system, you will have unique page IDs. Each page has an ID, a unique address that you can use to refer to that page. And that's meant here when I say get PX. So basically it, that could be like get page 42. And then the database system must be able to retrieve that page from uh, the underlying storage layer. So basically, this returns a reference, on other words, a pointer uh, in your software to that page, to the data that resides on that page. Uh, fix means that the page may not be evicted anymore. Eviction means you remove it from the database buffer. So if you call get and then fix on, a, on page 42, no other operation uh, is allowed to remove that page from the database buffer. Again, it sits here, yeah? so that you will load the page, you will fix the page, and then it sits there. And once it sits there, the, the database system and, and the programs that run the database system can operate on that page. But for that, you have to fix the page. And once you're done working on that page, you will unfix it which signals to the database buffer, oh yeah, yeah, now you're allo allowed to remove that page if you want. Uh, you don't have to, but I, there's, I don't need it anymore, so you can remove it if you want. Um, yeah, this is a predicate telling you whether a specific page is already available on the buffer. So you can basically check for page 42 if it's already there. And then the important thing, and we will get to that in a moment, is the choose page method. That chooses a page to evict and returns a reference to the page. So again, assume the situation, the database buffer is full. It needs to load a new page because someone said get page uh, seven, but there is no room available here. Everything is already loaded with stuff. In that situation, you have to get rid of one of the pages to make room for the new page seven to load. Huh? And well, how does that work? Let's look at that. That's the pseudocode that explains that. Um, so basically what the get method in the database buffer does is the following. Assume you want to uh, have page 42. And uh, well, you can check first, well, if it's already there, I'm already done, right? So everything is fine. So you check whether that's in the buffer already. If, if that is the case, you're done. And you just return a reference to that page. Um, but if not, if it's not in the buffer, th well, then you have to do something. So the first is you check, is there space to load um, a page? Yeah? Um, so if that is the case, then uh, there's, if there's space available, we, we're in this branch, right? Then you say, okay, I get a free slot. You, you, pick, you have a list, you, you keep a list of the free um, slots you have in your um, database buffer. Yeah, and then basically you, um, you get a handle to that slot and then you basically load the page from disk into that slot and afterwards the page is available in the buffer. Yeah? But that's the easy case, you are, there's still room available for the page, you simply load it here in line seven, everything is fine. It gets more complex if, there's, if the buffer is full and that is what we see here. So basically here is the point in time where you have to choose a page to evict, uh, uh, evicting meaning that page has to leave the database buffer. That page is going to be removed from main memory to make room for the new page to load. And that is what happens here. 
So a choose page algorithm could be something you could you you also should have seen in an undergrad co co um, course like uh, least recently used LAU or FIFO first in first out. So these buffer replacement strategies you know from hardware, the same things um, can be used here. Again, indication that on the different layers, similar techniques uh, can be used successfully. So basically, this algorithm gives you a victim page, a page to kick out. And then again, you must not simply kick out the page, but you, you, have, to be, you have to first check whether that page was modified. So it may have happened that the page was changed, but not written back to the layer underneath. So if that is the case, you first have to write that page PI back to external memory, yeah, the changed version, the new version has to be written to external memory. And only when you did that, you can load the new page over that old page. Yeah, that's very important. So um, if it wasn't modified, yeah, if it was only read, it's fine. You just overwrite it with a new page PX. But if it was modified, well, you better be careful to not lose stuff, right? Okay. Um, yeah, that's the um, get implementation, the get implementation of the database buffer. And similar algorithms sit in between all these layers. Yeah, Basically, in between all these layers, there's a task that, okay, if the stuff is not here, but you need it due to, due to the inclusion property, you first have to load it from the layer underneath. And there's something like a buffering mechanism in between. Yeah? What I'm saying here is simply, okay, if, you, if in this course, if we talk about buffering in between main memory and uh, the disks, flash or hard disk underneath, there's a software component doing that, and that's called the database buffer. And that has some impact on performance, in particular when you think about, okay, how, which page do I remove? Which page do I evict to uh, make room for new pages? That has quite some impact. Okay, so let's briefly go through um, the questions. What do we have here? What's the textbooks that we must study for the course? Well, the problem with databases is the textbooks are relatively old. So I once wrote a textbook for my course, um, for, for, for an old iteration of this course. Uh, the PDF is available uh, for free for download. I will put a link into CMS. Um, that also has links to uh, videos that, that explain some of the material. I think that's a good starting point. Most of the material I will, we will be covering in this course will be explained in that book and in that older videos as well. And again, the video I'm presenting here is available anyway afterwards the lecture. Um, other than that, there are many old books. That's the problem a little bit. And old books mean, say, they're focusing a lot on disk-based systems, which is not exactly state-of-the-art anymore. So. Um, there are books here and there I would recommend, but they're a bit outdated. That's unfortunate. Uh, there, there's no really up-to-date database book. Um, yeah, that's about textbooks. For memory database, do we need a DB buffer? Not really, that's a good question. So um, people get into that multiple times. So basically, modern systems, what they do is, let's go back to this one. Um, Say main memories are often so big that you can load all the memory in um, that you can load all the data in main memory anyway. At no point in time, you need to load stuff from disk to main memory because main memory is so big. Yeah? You can basically, when when starting up your database, you load everything from disk and then whatever comes in, it's already in main memory. Yeah, yeah. But then you have writes. So think about that. What happens if you write data? If you modify data, it sits in main memory and you have a power failure. Boom, all modifications, all writes are gone. So even in the main memory system, you must at some point write data to a persistent medium. Otherwise, you are really in trouble if anything goes wrong. It can be a power failure. It can be flood flooding in your data center. It can be whatever, uh, destruction of hardware or software. You're really in trouble um, if anything goes wrong. So even in a main memory system, it's kind of a misleading term. Those systems have to write out at least um, a protocol, a log, as we call it, of the changes. And we will go to that later on. It's an important question, and it's uh, often overlooked. Um, so if you modify data, you have to also write something here. That's very important. Good question. Is the default page state fixed or unfixed in the database buffer? Um, 
Well, there, there are different ways to implement that, but, but here, uh, basically what I do it, I make it part of the implementation. I say it's fixed anyway. If I do get on the page, I also fix it, fix it, and then whatever is returned by the get method, it's already fixed. Uh, uh, but you can uh, implement that in either way, and then you have to be careful um, with transactional properties because you, you return a handle that's not fixed. Meanwhile, the page gets evicted again by a concurrent query because it wasn't fixed yet. So the better implementation is obviously to, to when loading, you fix it already to make sure it doesn't get unfixed and um, evicted by a concurrent process. That's very important. Now the process can load and change the data anymore. Fix means, um, no, it's not exactly the same as a lock. So a lock would mean, lo locks are typically used, uh, as you recall from our undergrad discussions uh, about concurrency, concurrency control, that um, locks are used to avoid concurrent writes. Uh, concurrent reads are not a problem. And um, even if you fix a page in the database buffer, you may still allow multiple queries to read this stuff at the same time. So you don't have to get a lock, um, at least you don't have to get an exclusive lock, yeah? So you could, um, I mean, you could implement it through read locks, yeah? And then as long as there's any lock available, you don't evict that, yeah? yeah. In, in that sense, it's true, you can map it to the same process. Yeah, that is true. Why do we find when we get it? It seems like I could construct scenarios when the, if not page and buffer is always set if I was leading to if not, changes. I think I could construct scenarios where the is always sent. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you can create all kinds of uh, scenarios where you uh, ruin performance, and we will get into that. In particular, the different choose page algorithm strategies. I mentioned LAU. Yeah, they they're, they're easy scenarios where you can uh, completely ruin performance with those strategies. So. Um, but, but, but the bottom line here is of this approach is if, if you want to make a database system that is generic and works for all kinds of queries and data, you have to come up with a generic solution. And the generic solution is typically one of these page eviction strategies and a generic algorithm. Uh, we will, um, I guess in the exercise, we will look at one example at least where we uh, see um, how to, how to um, ruin such an um, algorithm. Can we make sure choose page select pages that are known but have been modified? Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's one thing you could do. Again, what happens if all pages were already modified? Game over. You can't load a page anymore. So typically, how to fix that, what you do is in the database buffer, that's an additional optimi optimization you can do here is if you have pages that were modified, you have a background thread that writes out those pages. Yeah, and then recall if the page is written out by background thread, well, the changes are reflected on disk and, and now you don't run into this branch anymore. Yeah, that would avoid that scenario. So you could actually, following your suggestion, you could do that. You could say, okay, I modify my choose page to only um, write out, to only pick pages that were not modified. And I can do that as long as I have a background thread running that writes out the modified pages regularly to make room, to, 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 make to uh, allow for opportunities for evicting pages. Yeah? That you could do, that's true, good point. Uh, what's your take on how does the storage in a, yeah, and we, maybe we can go into that later. So that's another interesting storage layer popping up, it's important, depends on your scenario. For the moment, let me focus on SSD and hard disk, but of course, there are all kinds of new media like, uh, um, persistent uh, RAM style and media, many, many things that can be done. Um, I simplified the presentation here a little bit um, to not make it too confusion, confusing. How large is the performance increase when using SSD? We will go into that. that that's a huge increase. We will go into that today. Um, and multi-core scenario might happen, the copy. Uh, yeah, yeah, we will look at multi-core in a moment. Uh, don't worry. Okay, so that's the database buffer. And there are two important terms that, that occur here. So basically what, what you see is uh, one is temporal locality and um, the other is spatial locality. And temporal locality basically means you have a small distance in time for the same address. So basically how you could 
view the database buffer as it gets requests from the system. Hey, give, give me page 42, page 7, page 8, page 9, page 42, and so forth. And temporal lo locality means that the same address is requested um, after a short period in time. Yeah, it's not that I have 42 today and tomorrow, it's 42 and a millisecond later, it's 42. And uh, another millisecond, it's 42 again. So there's a small distance in, bec in between requesting the same page. And of course, for those pages, it's a good idea to keep them in, mem um, uh, in the database buffer. Yeah? Because, I mean, if I unload it in between a millisecond later, I would have to load it again into the page. So, I mean, that's something I could avoid. Yeah? So temporal lo locality is a good indication of something should be kept in the database buffer. And a similar concept or generalization of temporal locality actually is spatial locality. So again, uh, the point of view from, of the database buffer is you have a sequence of address references, uh, a, a sequence, uh, give me page uh, 42, 7, 8, 9, whatever. And um, basically here what, what we have is we have a small distance in time for similar addresses. So it, it doesn't have to be um, the same address, but it can actually be a similar address. And why is similarity important here? Well, often you observe on those storage layers that data that resides close, physically close, on the same st storage medium, often. That depends on the storage medium, but, but often it's the case that it um, can be quicker accessed than it can be accessed when it's further away. We'll also go into that when we talk about hard disks later on. So basically that's a, a generalization. Um, small distance in time for a similar address, uh, not only the same address. Yeah, I think I will skip over those examples. I explained them already. Um, yeah, and um, so now we look at the general properties of a storage hierarchy and let's look at some important pieces of hardware that we can observe there. And one is hard disk. Um, I'm for sure some of you may have never seen this stuff, but that's a storage medium that uh, was still popular until, I don't know, 10 years ago even inside um, desktop PCs, inside CPUs, inside servers was pretty popular. These days it's mostly used for backup external hard drives for very large uh, drives uh, that would be too expo um, expensive if you bought them as an SSD. So, but, but that's how people store data beginning from the 70s and 80s. And the basic idea of this device is yet you have um, Let's go to a schematic view. You have these rotating metal discs. Yeah? They're called the platters. Yeah, they sit on the spindle and that rotates pretty fast, a couple of thousand rotations per minute. Um, and then basically you have disc heads that can magnetize or demagnetize a certain position. So basically, um, if the um, disc head here, so here they have disc, head, disc heads uh, for each and every platter for, for the, um, um, the top uh, for, from above and below. So for each platter you have two disc heads. You can um, write from this side and from, from underneath to the platter. So this means uh, in this scenario where we have five platters, <coughs> we have 10 different surfaces to write to. to. So we have 10 different disc heads. I'm sorry. Okay, and how this device works, basically you go back to this um, image, is these platters rotate and then you can position this, this array of disc heads on a certain position. And that position is called the cylinder. So for one platter, you would call it a track, yeah? basically the circle that is defined by the, um, by the stuff that's directly under this disc arm, the head. Huh? So here, basically, this has a uh, that is a disc arm, and those are the heads. The heads are used for magnetizing and demagnetizing a certain position. And if it's in a certain position and a certain angle, of course, it defines this circular um, track, a virtual track. That's not a real track in the sense. It's a virtual tra track defined by the angle of the arm. And at all times, you can only write to write or read from or to one of the heads. You can't write to all of the 10 surfaces concurrently. You can't write to, to multiple. You only can write to one uh, 
of those surfaces. And uh, that's basically how it works. So whenever you want to read some data, what happens is if you have a random address, a random piece of information you want to read from that disk, you first have to position this disk arm. It first has to do this movement to the right track. Yeah, then you have to actually um, enable the right disk head. It also takes a, a fraction of a time. Then you have to do fine tuning because for some of the tracks, um, um, there may be a little bit to the left and to the right. There's a lot of machinery going on, but only then, well, you would th think so, you would be available, but then think about the rotation. Yeah? So the rotation means, well, maybe now you're on the right position, you're on the right virtual track, but it's on the opposite side of the disk. Yeah? Assume you position it to, the, to this position here, and you want to, so you're now in the right angle, the right position, but the stuff you want to read is here, right? Then you still have to wait till that position is available under the disk head. This phenomenon is called rotational delay. So you have to wait this um, moment till the platters rotate under your disk head. And only then you're available to read or write data, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And of course, I mean, this is a physical device. Uh, you may imagine that may take a while. Posi positioning such an arm to a random position, reading random stuff from such a medium, that's a problem. That used to be the problem in, in systems using this because we're talking about the order of five milliseconds. And five milliseconds is already pretty fast. So uh, a cheap, like backup uh, hard disk you, you will buy these days is more on the order of 10 milliseconds or even slower. And that's just an average number. So the, it depends on how far you move the arm, if it's just an adjacent track here, it's much quicker, it's one millisecond, but if you do the full round from the innermost um, track to the outermost track, that may take forever, right? Um, but that's the principle of hard disks. Yeah? That's um, what you need about hard disks. And um, why would we care about that? Well, the industry is kind of slow moving, so um, it's still used in many uh, legacy systems. Um, major database products are still disk-based. Many of the systems were developed for disk-based um, access. That was the idea. So for instance, Postgres or major flagship products in database markets. Still many of those systems are in use and they're super cheap. Yeah, You can still buy the stuff if you have large amounts of data to store. Well, you could do it on an SSD, of course, but if it's really large and you're running out of money, maybe you, you take a hard disk, maybe that's fine, right? So in particular for very large data sets, that's still something you may consider. Yeah, and the important ratio we, we need to be looking at, and I explained it already, and the graphic is um, that is this positioning time, that's the arm, mov arm movement, that's also called the seek time, seek to a specific position. Yeah, and that's the time to position your arm. The rotational delay, yeah, the time it takes to till um, the right um, uh, position gets becomes available and then the actual transfer time so really the to read the stuff from that rotating platter that's the cost of a random access and if you look at the cost of a se sequential access what you do here is well you first also have to go to the right position then you wait for the rotational delay you do the um, uh, you have to transfer the stuff that's fine but then what um, may happen is um, I mean, assume you exhausted reading an entire track here. You read the entire track. So what's next? Yeah, so assume a large file you want to read or write from disk. And how it happens is uh, typically, so you read the entire track from one surface, from one diskette, from one surface of one platter. Then you switch to the next, next diskette on the same cylinder. So you don't move the disk arm, you just switch heads. Yeah, and then you read the next track and so forth. You basically, you first switch through all heads. Then once you're done with that, you can hopefully seek to an adjacent track, to an adjacent cylinder. So that's a layout that's used for large disks, uh, for, for large files on such a device that you basically first switch through all heads without moving the disk arm. Then you try to position the disk arm to the next track. That's a minimal movement that doesn't take five milliseconds, but typically one millisecond. And like that, you can relatively quickly reach la uh, read, la read or write large files. It's basically the idea of reading large files. Okay, with that, um, yeah, that's uh, maybe um, 
that's a little optimization you could do. Um, basically, when switching heads, you could uh, you still have the problem of rotational delay. And, and one optimization you could do in that scenario is laying out your data on the disk such that while you're moving the arm to the adjacent track, um, of course, uh, the platter keeps rotating, right? Yes, yeah, so you maybe you have a certain angle that is um, um, where the platter is moved. Uh, let's assume that's this whatever 20, 20 degrees. Yeah, and now if all of your tracks start at the same angle, yeah, and now you spend some time moving the disc arm to the next adjacent track, well, then you're in trouble because you have to wait till the right position comes into place again. So what you do in this scenario is you synchronize the, the placement of data on disk um, with a rotational delay, and that's called track skewing. So basically, you position data in a way such that once you positioned your disk arm to the next adjacent track, um, the right position come, uh, is immediately available because you positioned it such that the, um, the relational, um, rotation, rotational delay is compensated for. Yeah? That's a, a little nice optimization that can be played here. The important thing, and, and that's um, what I'm trying to show you um, with this graph and the following experiment we will be doing after the break, is that there are huge differences in performance evolution over the years, and this is 50 years of evolution. Huh? So even in 1970, there are that uh, super big hard disk. And um, it was the same physical principle that was used. Uh, yeah? Things get sm got smaller, the, the data could be packed dense, more densely, that's all fine. But the principal parameters we will be looking at in this lecture is always those two. The average access time to read stuff randomly or write stuff randomly, and the sequential bandwidth, so how much data can I read, scratch from disk, maximum yeah, or average, yeah? but how much can I read sequentially, um, in, in best, worst, and average case, yeah, but I, I reduce it to one number here. And if you look at that, so basically the average access time back then, 50 years ago, was, was about 30 milliseconds. Yeah? It was pretty okay for the time, for the, for the performance um, you had in different devices there. Sequential uh, um, performance was like 800 kilobytes, 0 0.8 megabytes. Well, and then in uh, 2020, and of course it, it depends a lot on what you pick here. This is a more high-end disk drive we are showing here, and that goes down to even 2.9 milliseconds. This is awesome for physical, um, for, for a hard disk. And it's an awesome access time. It's fantastic. And sequential um, bandwidth here is 253 megabytes. Well, now, if you look at the ratio, at the improvement factor, how these things ga got improved over time, you see, well, here we have a tenfold improvement in average access time over 50 years with respect to um, random access. However, in sequential bandwidth, we have 316 times the performance. So this the sequential performance imp uh, improved so much more compared to the um, random access performance. And that's a thing that will probably continue over the next years as well yeah, if, for those devices. That's a physical barrier that's very hard to overcome that, well, you have this disk arm that needs to be positioned, then it takes a couple of milliseconds. It's a physical thing you're moving. And that takes some time. And that's the reason why this didn't improve too much, but the bandwidth due to higher rotation speeds, higher densities, stuff like that, improved dramatically. Yeah, with that, I would say, before I explain the following experiment, we will go into the break. I will be available on Discord. We will continue at 1.20. Yeah, at 1.20, I will continue with the lecture. See you then.
Okay, let's continue. So, so we looked at the different properties of the de devices over like 50 years. And we've seen that random access doesn't get too much bigger and so too much better, but uh, sequential access gets uh, so much better. And with that, you can do a little experiment. Uh, assume the following experiment where you want to read a thousand blocks of eight kilobytes each from different devices. So basically the costs for that, you can measure it, but you could also calculate it. Basically now as we have cost formulas, if you know, hey, you have an average access time to get to one specific block, and then you have the time you needed to read that block from disk times 1000. So it's really a worst case scenario where you assume it's, it's obviously average access time. This can be faster, in particular if it's on the same cylinder, uh, if, it's, if it's adjacent cylinders, yeah? but, but that, that's basically uh, a simple math, uh, back of the envelope calculation you could do. In contrast to that, the sequential rate read of a thousand blocks and, and the situation that those blocks are luckily positioned one after another. So basically you just have the initial average access time to position your disk arm and then it's just about reading the stuff at, at full bandwidth. That's the time. Yeah? Well. We can do that calculation for the two devices and then basically we end up with these numbers. So here you see that, um, well, yeah, if you do that experiment on this device, it takes about 40 seconds if read randomly. Here it um, takes about three seconds. Yeah, so it improved by a factor 13.8. Whereas you did a sequential read here, it was about 10 seconds, so it's 10,000 milliseconds. And uh, now it's 34 milliseconds because the sequential bandwidth is enormous on this device. So basically an improvement of factor 302. Yeah, so this improved, um, so here, and, and that, that's the interesting number here, the, the ratio of improvement when switching from random reads to sequential reads on this old device was, was a factor of four. Yeah, you improved. Um, by a factor of four, whereas if you do it here, you improve by a factor of 327. So much earlier, so the, the newer the device, the earlier it will pay off to do sequential reads rather than random accesses. Yeah? So on many of those devices and many of the, of the algorithms try to avoid random reads at all costs, try to group random reads into, into bigger blocks and play all kinds of tricks to just don't do random access on a hard disk. That's a big uh, part of the game. Yeah. Okay, so here's a little uh, graphic just to show you. Um, I picked it from that uh, URL underneath here. It's on the slides anyway, so if you're interested, take a look. Basically, um, that's the evolution of the uh, two parameters for some enterprise disks. And you see we were still like in the tens of megabytes in the 90s. And then that went up to something like 200 something megabytes per second. Little difference with respect to read and write, but basically the same performance. So, and then when you look at the latency, so that's the yeah, random access time. Um, so many, many different terms typically used for the same thing, but latency means uh, the time. So that latency is typically the, the entire thing, the positioning of the arm and reading, scratching this block uh, from disk. Um, so depending on how you define it, but, but the, the, the major bottleneck here is anyway positioning the disk arm. Um, and then you see that that's uh, times we had. So, so some devices even go down to one uh, millisecond. That's insane. Uh, that's, that's really, really great. Uh, so, so there was a long time when we were in this space and some larger devices now, um, some other devices uh, in that space. Okay, so with that, uh, let's look at some more modern uh, storage medium. And, and all of you have that. You have, have it on, on these SD cards, um, USB drives, and all kinds of smartphones. They don't have hard disks anymore. <laughs> Assume your smartphone had a little hard disk. Uh, that would uh, eat up uh, a lot of energy. And uh, maybe once you throw your smartphone on the on the floor, it's not only that your screen is broken, but maybe the hard disk as well. So a hard disk with mechanical parts is not so robust when you throw it on the floor, right? That breaks much easier uh, than a solid state disk. A solid state disk is also a persistent medium, but it doesn't have moving parts. There are different types of technology. Uh, but the 
basic properties that are important for us here is that it's non-volatile. So non-volatile meaning you switch off the power, still everything is there. That's the same property with hard disk, non-volatile. If you switch off the power, everything is still available on those platters in contrast to DRAM. Yeah, if you switch off, uh, if you cut off the power supply of DRAM, everything is gone. Uh, that's it. Um, and that's called um, non-volatile memory. So it's robust, it has no moving parts. And the important number is this one. It's about 100 times faster with respect to random access. Yeah? Again, mileage may vary. It depends a lot on the concrete devices. But for, from an architectural point of view, from a database um, architect, that's an important number. Two orders of magnitude, better random access, that's something. That's something um, that gives you a lot. Plus, what most of these devices allow you to do is parallel access. You can have multiple streams of random accesses concurrently and they still have uh, awesome performance. Um, so again, depending on the device, uh, you may have uh, half a dozen to a dozen parallel streams uh, where you scratch, off, scratch random um, uh, data from, from different positions randomly and they don't interfere with each other. And, and if you think about that, that's not possible in a hard disk. That's at all times you can read from one cylinder, from one head, this one track says at, at all times there's only one random access that's being served by the disk. That's different on a solid um, state drive where you can serve multiple of them at the same time. Yeah, that's another performance advantage um, you receive here. Make, make, it's a huge game changer in those devices. Huh? Well, and um, yeah, here's the comparison of the major properties you have to keep in mind. So here the random access again can be up down to one, two milliseconds for the super expensive devices or 10, 15 for the <coughs> cheap ones. But here we are in this ballpark, so smaller than uh, 0.1 milliseconds. And sequential access is also um, a huge uh, difference. So as uh, for, for hard disk drives, we had about 200 megabytes per second. Here it can be several gigabytes per second. It's a huge difference. We don't have parallel access, as mentioned before. We have parallel access. And the price, again, that some average may, may change and changes quickly, it gets cheaper uh, like every day almost. But there's an order of magnitude difference at least in, the, in those prices. Again, performance parameters uh, change the price tag dramatically, but that's basically a rule of thumb, yeah, you can keep in mind. Yeah, there's already a question about rate. <laughs> I haven't even talked about that. Come on, come on, students, uh, right? Ask stuff about uh, things I presented already. <laughs> Someone asked me about rate zero. Okay, yeah, so with that, let's look at some other architectures that are around you. You find frequently in, in particular server architectures. So that's what I explained so far. So you have uh, one core, one, one CPU, these caches, main memory, flash and hard disk. Yeah? But of course you can now play all kinds of games with that. You could say, well, what if you have a CPU that has multiple cores? That's basically state of the art these days. Yeah? So back in the old days, you had one core and the CPU and that's it. I'm not sure whether you can even buy, you can still buy this stuff anymore, maybe for, for, um, for portable devices. Yeah, but in, in any laptop, any, any desktop, PC, any server, anyway, you have a situation like that. You have one CPU and that has a couple of cores. And then storage hierarchy looks a bit different. So it looks something like, it may look something like that, can, can, can also uh, look differently. Uh, you have the different cores. Um, they have separate L1 and L2 caches. They don't share the L1 and L2 caches and they may have an L3 cache. Yeah? Some, some architectures also have individual L3 caches and then a shared L4 cache. Uh, that's another architecture that's possible. And then there's main memory and then there's flash and hard disk. Yeah? And then you see things may become complicated. For instance, in that scenario, assume you have one integer, you load it into main memory and then you load it into L2 and L1. For this core, for the for this core here, let's assume you load a specific value, and then all of a sudden the other core also wants to work on that data. So now what happens? You're in trouble. Everything may happen here, right? You have to understand that the data already now lives in this L2 cache. It lives on hard disk. You have to be sure not to construct race conditions to not kill the change uh, this core did on that data item, and so forth and so forth. Yeah, so you can do entire lectures on that. I think as part of the systems architecture lecture, <laughs> at least at our university, these things um, 
uh, taught. Yeah? So, yeah. so you have opportunity for replication, um, but, but basically things get more complicated, uh, but uh, you also have a huge opportunity for performance. Uh, think about a scenario where there are no conflicts, yeah? where you make sure that the cores, that the threats that are running on the different cores are orchestrated in a way that they don't read the same data. They all read this joint data, all different parts of the data. And then you have a, yeah, you see a four times, uh, um, the, the four, uh, four times more cores, yeah? and then you have, and though they, they ship with individual L1 and L2 caches where they can do stuff, right? and they don't have to synchronize uh, this with, with the other cores if, if there's no conflict. Or they, 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 as long as there's no conflict, um, um, there's no, no problem. Yeah. So that's a very um, important architecture, multiple cores. But of course, we can do it even more complex, and that is called a non-uniform memory access architecture. So what I'm doing here is, if you go back, here I had a CPU with four cores. Now I have two CPUs with four cores each. Yeah? That's what an architecture looks like these days. And then attached to each of the CPUs is main memory. So here you see the what, 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 what used to be a single storage layer, a single main memory storage layer is now split into two parts. Yeah? And on the board, that means that this is attached kind of to this CPU, this is attached to this CPU. And uh, this CPU, so the important difference is that uh, the access time from the point of view of this CPU to this part of main memory is faster than accessing this point. Yeah? So if this CPU wants to access stuff here, it's a little faster than accessing stuff there, yeah, and vice versa. So if this CPU wants to access stuff here, it's faster than accessing stuff there. That's called non-uniform memory access, non-uniform saying, yeah, it's not the same access time anymore, right? Yeah, If I only have one uh, layer as here, it's always more or less the same access time. There's no major difference you can observe. But if you do an architecture like that, you want to factor this stuff in, um, yeah. And that's basically non-uniform memory access um, architecture, also pretty popular in um, database systems. And of course, there are other tricks you can play. One is um, based on the idea of RAID, redundant array of inexpensive disks. And what that does to your storage hierarchy is following. So again, back to the single disk, single CPU, single core storage hierarchy, you can exchange the upper part arbitrarily by the stuff I just showed you. But what if we do something here? Yeah, we, what if we split this layer into two layers and say, well, now I don't have a single disk, I have multiple disks. So you could do that. And there's a longer story to that, and that's called RAID. Um, that is proposed by Patterson et al. from Berkeley and has become pretty popular in database systems, but in general, computer systems. And many, many systems that um, handle data um, uh, user stuff. And so in the following, I will go uh, through different rate levels. So um, what is a rate level? A rate level defines how I make use of multiple disks. So as shown in the picture before, now I have two disks. I can do the same uh, game with SSDs, huh? no difference, or whatever storage medium you can even play the game with DRAM if you want, right? But here we, we focus on hard disks visually, but the same technique applies to all storage medium. So, and the idea here is I have blocks of data. Again, recall a block of data in my world is four kilobytes of stuff. Yeah? So I have four kilobytes of data here and I call that block one. And uh, so there's block two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So basically, if you have a file consisting of eight blocks of data, eight blocks of four kilobytes each, then how you make use of those two disks in RAID zero is the following. The first block is positioned on this disk, the second block on this that disk, the third on that. Uh, uh -huh. So the strategy, you may know how it's called, it's called round robin. Yeah? You basically distribute data um, round robin over the different disks. Well, and that it has pros and cons. Huh? So it, it definitely increases the sequential and random read and write performance. Now, assume you, you need to read the entire file, yeah? the entire file consisting of eight blocks. So what can you do? You can read from those two disks concurrently. You can read 
those four blocks and those four blocks con concurrently. You don't have to first read this and then read that. No need for that. You can read concurrently and double the performance. And of course, this also works for more than two disks. You can basically use an arbitrary number. You can use 10 disks or 20 or 100, whatever. And basically that's a performance advantage you um, then observe yeah? times the number of disks you use for that. Unless there's another bottleneck uh, that, that uh, is forbidding uh, to, to transfer as much data to your CPU. Uh, but, but that's a different story. So for the moment, this is a great way to improve performance. And, and the same happens for, for random um, accesses, of course. If, uh, if you have um, a random access here and a random access there, no one forces you to first do the random access here, then wait for the result and then do the random access there. You can send them concurrently. Well, and then you get two random accesses for the price of one, right? And that's a big advantage of this approach, of course. So it basically reduces the load that you observe on each of the disks. You know? And you can use as many disks as you want. So that's a very popular um, thing, rate zero. Well, another that's an extreme way of making use of these um, disks. Another uh, thing that you can do um, is rate one, rate level one. And what you do here is, so you don't uh, distribute the data over the different disks, but you say all disks have the same data. So here you say block one is here, block one is there, block two, two, three, three, three. And for if I had wanted to store all the eight blocks for my file, well, then I would should also depict block five, six, seven, eight, yeah? because this is only depicting blocks one, two, four. Yeah? But bottom line is all disks have the same data and what you increase by that is, I mean, now assume you want to read an entire file. Well, you have the same performance as of one disk. But if you have multiple requests coming on, um, coming in, yeah, different, say, secret queries yes, that need to be computed and touch different parts of the data, it could be that one disk is serving that request, the other disk is serving that other request. So they retrieve different um, portions of the data. That's one thing you could do. Or what you could do is, of course, if you um, want to read all of the file, you can still share the load in, in, in that sense that you say, okay, the first half, the first, um, let's say the first two blocks I read from this disk while concurrently reading the blocks B3 and B4 from that disk. Yeah? So you still have to speed up here um, in terms of reading speed. However, you don't have that with respect to writes. And that's a huge difference to write zero if you go back. So here, if you write any block, um, so if you have, have a, a, a multiple blocks that need to be written, so each block only has to be written to one disk. In contrast, in write one, if you touch any of the blocks, all of the disks have to write that block. So that can become a bottleneck. Yeah? If you have 10 disks, and you change block three, you better write it back to all of the 10 disks. And that's something that's not so beneficial in this approach. So, yeah, and then, um, well, that's the performance aspect, but the other aspect that's important in when discussing rate levels here is now what happens in these scenarios if you lose one of the disks, not in the lose, oh, where, where, where is it? Oh, oh, I lost it, somehow is it in that draw or the other one? No if you have a hardware failure. So disks may break, that happens quickly, and there are numbers about that. Um, you also find numbers on SSDs. So that's a, a scenario you have to plan for, you have to be um, able to cope with. Any modern computer architecture has to factor in that disks will break. And if you have important data on your disks or SSDs, you better have a strategy to make sure you to get your data back. You know? And well, if you look at those different scenarios, you will see, well, in rate zero, if you lose any of those disks, it's over, you're in trouble, the data is gone. You better have a good backup, but from those disks, if you here lose that disk, only the odd blocks will be available to you, the even blocks are gone and vice versa. In contrast, in rate one, as you have full replication, as long as one of the disks is still there, so assume you have 10 disks and nine of the disks break, which is super unlikely, as, the, as long as you have one disk, you still have all the data available. Yeah? And that's a big advantage of RAID 1. So those are two extremes. And now uh, we're again seeking a compromise. And the compromise 
looks something like that. Um, so that's the first approach that was done and that was called RAID4. And the idea is to come to um, have something that's very similar to RAID0. So we do the striping, the round robin distribution over the different disks, but we have an additional parity mechanism, a security mechanism, um, no, actually a safety mechanism allowing us to, um, to survive disk failures. So the idea here is, if you just look at those uh, blocks we had before, it's again, if you, if you only look at the first three disks, then you see that's basically RAID0. It's the same idea. You just stripe the blocks, distribute them round robin over the different disks, block one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In addition to that, you keep an extra disk that's called the parity disk that has a so-called stripe parity for each of those um, former blocks. And the idea is you compute the stripe parity as block one, XOR block two, XOR block three. With that, you receive the stripe parity and that you store on that disk. And this XOR mechanism has a nice property. Now, if you lose any of the disks, you will be able to recompute the data that was on that disk originally. So in any order, no, no matter which, of, uh, which one you lose, assume you lose this disk and block two is not available anymore, you can reconstruct uh, block two by just reading B1, stripe one parity, B3, X or everything, and then you're back into, and then you, be, then you have B2. So this is also means that for, for commercial, uh, for, for, hard, uh, for rate systems that typically done, in, you can do it in hardware and software, but in hardware systems, why the system is running, you can, can just rip off one of the disks. No problem, the system keeps on running. You insert a new disk into the system and the system will realize, do all the XORing magic, eventually, that um, system will have the right copy of the data and can survive um, a disk failure. Yeah? So that's a very robust and very stable um, system for something like that. Okay, with that, maybe look a little bit at um, our questions here. Does RAID 0 benefit all disks at all in terms of access times? Um, yeah. So that's RAID 0, where we were. Yeah, I explained that at length at least. You get um, uh, through striping, uh, at least the sequence, I mean, both random and sequential, I, I all get improved. Yeah? Yeah, that's true. In spite of it might happen that the copy now is different from DRAM. In multi core scenario, what? Let's go back. Well, not in this visualization because um, I mean, it depends again on how much you implement the inclusion and how much you stick to the inclusion property and how, how uh, the system architecture organizes the L3. But if it's, a, uh, if it's inclusion property, so whatever is here in the L1 and L2 also has to be there, then L3 is a synchronization point. If you break up L3 into um, different layers, well, then you have synchronization issues again. Uh, that was that one. Uh, is NUMA used across data centers? It's used in data centers. I mean, the point is, I mean, in that sense, maybe what you mean is, um, so this visual pattern, yeah, that there's, I mean, we're talking about the same machine, the same box that has two CPUs and multiple cores. Yeah, but you could play the same game on a much more coarse granular level. You could say, well, this is data center one, this is data center two, and then you have the same kinds of problems. So this hierarchical organization of memory also applies if you talk to, about data centers. I mean, later on I will show, um, I illustrate that using the, the network storage layer. We'll go to that in a moment. Uh, so that is right. Uh, do we have... Consistency issues across range, and for instance, we have to make sure that each disk has identical data when we read in person. But for me, how does rate handle this when writing? With yeah, th that's either software rate or hardware rate. Basically, the, uh, the different rate levels I'm explaining here, you read it like a contract. <laughs> so you have to maintain this stuff. You have to maintain these properties. 
either through software or through hardware. And if you don't, well, all things can go wrong. All things may happen uh, badly and uh, you don't want to do that, right? Uh, so if you violate those, the RAID contracts in any way, anything may happen. So if, for instance, in RAID 1, uh, block 2 differs from block, uh, block 2 on this disk, differs from block 2 on that disk, yeah, sure, then... <laughs> well, that it will make a difference whether the next query reads this block or the other blo uh, block. Because that's a consistency issue, and that has to be resolved in a. There has to be a transactional guarantee. Yeah? If you think about the asset properties again, it has to be done in a transaction. You can't just, yeah, if you write a new version of block two, you just can't uh, write this one and then eventually write the other one. No, you're in trouble. Yeah? You have to have a mechanism to synchronize that. Uh, that's a good question, yes. Um, whew, um, what is the overhead introduced by RAID? Well, again, depends. I, uh, I wrote it down on the slides with the read and write overhead, in particular for read one. Yeah, You have to write to all this. That's the overhead. You have to synchronize these things. Yeah. Um, software rate is typically a bit slower than hardware rate. Yeah. Then, if you do a hardware rate, basically to the outside, the entire device, even though it has multiple hard disks, looks like a, a single disk. Yeah? That's a big advantage. So in the storage hierarchy, it looks like as if you just installed a very big uh, hard disk. Yeah? Um, so it really depends on the devices, depends on the rate levels, what the overheads are. So one, one thing for overhead, of course, an obvious um, answer to that is in rate four, you see here, well, there's one extra disk that doesn't have data, meaningful data, right? It's just only three of the four disks have actual data. And this is just parity information, just correction codes that you use in case that any of the disks breaks down. Yeah? So basically, you pay the overheads for, for this one disk. Yeah? You pay for this, but only three of them are um, this is a net data, the actual data being used, because that's definitely overhead. Yeah? Okay, so do we have consistent data? Was we saw this doch schon. So rate found. Yeah, there's a question leading up to rate. Uh, yeah, so rate. Four, four, for you mean the number, wants to combine the benefits of RAID, but is uh, writing on RAID 4 system faster than writing on a RAID 1 system as you always up to the parity. Yeah, that, that's an issue. Yeah, So that's exactly an issue, the issue with RAID 4. So if you have a one disk that keeps all the parity, so whatever block you touch, you always have to touch the parity here on this device. That's a problem. Yeah? And now one, so this, uh, uh, for write, um, Operations as a high load on this parity disk. And um, how to improve that is to use RAID 5. That's the level that's actually used. RAID 4 is just a conceptual idea, but that shouldn't be used. What's used is RAID level 5. And what you do here is the same as in RAID 4. However, you also distribute the stripe parity round robin across all disks. So the write load is distributed over the different disks. Yeah? So it's the same pattern as before. So the, the first row is the same. If you go back, right, you say B1, B2, B3, stripe. But then you say um, the stripe now um, goes in that direction or the other, doesn't matter, but it's uh, distributed round robin. Yeah? And uh, the same um, mechanisms work. So the XORing to reconstruct any disk, but there's no special parity disk anymore. All of them for, all of the disks for certain blocks may have the role of parity information. And that's the stuff you use. That's the most uh, widely used rate level um, that can survive one disk failure. There are other rate levels that can even survive more failures. So those rate levels are called rate six or so-called nested rate levels. I have a video on that on YouTube if you're interested. I'll explain that in more detail for the moment. That's um, rate five. Um, yeah, that, that's in most cases um, the best situation. Yeah, and then of course there's another storage layer as already. Um, um, so whatever your computer on the internet is, uh, what, what your computer is. Um, so in terms of we have some sort of storage hierarchy, we have s some of the layers are split, split hard disk layers, split memory, NUMA, 
multi-core, whatever, whatever is in that purple box here, well, there's still more storage layers and those storage layers are servers on the internet. Yeah? So you could also treat them as any other layer in the storage hierarchy. Recall again what I told you in the beginning, they have very similar properties. So why model them with um, special models for special algorithms? It's kind of the same algorithms and the same techniques uh, will apply, but in particular when it comes to caching, buffering stuff locally on specific devices. Um, so the further you go out, so assume a situation, you have a server in Frankfurt, a server in Iceland and the server in the US, and of course, uh, getting data from the US takes longer than from Iceland than it takes from Frankfurt, when you sit in Saarbrücken at least. And uh, those are also layers you can model and uh, attach to this um, storage hierarchy. Yeah? So there's no difference. Okay, so the summary for today, what I wanted to show you is the properties of storage hierarchy impacts data efficiency. And by data efficiency, I mean that, um, as I told you last week already, uh, when you talk about database systems, the CPU is sometimes a problem, but much more often it's getting the data into the CPU to, in order to be able to do meaningful stuff. And that's what I mean by data efficiency. I wanna be, uh, I wanna organize my data, I wanna organize my hardware in ways that data can be loaded very quickly. And one part of the story is the storage hierarchy that we looked at uh, this week. Another part of the story is so-called data layouts. Excuse me. So we, look, <clears throat> we looked at um, the storage hierarchy and the hardware properties. And I told you that there are very similar tasks across all layers from L1 to servers on the internet. It's basically the same stuff. Yeah? So we have read strategies, what to read, when. When should I read stuff from a layer underneath? When should I read it into my memory and, and cache it? Yeah? inclusion property, I cache stuff from underneath. Um, what is the right caching strategy? Yeah, based on what do I decide what I want to cache? Yeah? What do I keep on my layer and until when? Yes, yeah, so like an expiry date or do I count accesses? Is it like the least recently used? Is it FIFO? Whatever, any of these strategies that may make a huge difference. How do I do the caching? Is it hardware or software? I told you that uh, from uh, the CPU to main memory, that's basically, you don't have to worry about that. Hardware is doing all of that for you, plus your operating system uh, helps with that. But uh, yeah, once you try to get data into main memory from disk or from SSD, well, there's some software mechanism and that software mechanism in a database is called the database buffer and that has to make decisions. Then there are write strategies. <clears throat> As one of you pointed out, well, if it's a main memory database system, I don't have to write. Well, you do if you change something in your main memory system and you wanna make it um, persistent, even then there's a write strategy. And it's important to understand, well, when do I write, yeah? If you write every time you change something in your register, then you always will pay the price of waiting for the slowest storage layer underneath. You don't want to do that. Yeah? You want to have something better, something where you only write eventually and don't, don't bring down the performance of your write operations. So we will look at concrete algorithms uh, in the course of this lecture. Yeah, the most, one of the most important things is this random and sequential I.O. trade-off. We will look at that multiple times um, uh, again in this lecture. It's really important to have that in mind. Uh, that there's such a huge difference for, for certain devices, whether you do random access or whether you do sequential accesses. And I showed you these split layers. Yeah? So NUMA is an example for, for splitting up a layer. The memory, the main memory, the DRAM is split. Yeah? And then you have different access times all of a sudden. RAID is an idea for splitting this disk layer, hard disk or, or flash, um, into multiple devices. And even on the network, of course, if you look for, and here, of course, on this level, it's not just the server in Frankfurt, there are all kinds of servers that have the same distance to, to myself in this case. So there would be a huge graph of servers here uh, that's already a split storage layer. Yeah, with that, that's it for today. And now let's look at the questions you have. In red one, do we need to write multiple times and that would decrease the performance? Let's go to red one, rate one. So the question is, 
Um, do we need to write multiple times? And then yeah, yeah, of course. Whenever you change anything here, if any, any data on the blocks, I mean, because this block should represent the same information, right? It's just on the on the disk level that you say, okay, I uh, stored multiple times on these different devices. But from the user perspective, who's reading and writing uh, the, those blocks, it should always be the same information, which implies when reading, you have the choice. You can read it from this disk or the other disk. But when writing, sorry, you have to write it to all of the copies. Yeah? Otherwise, you may really be in trouble. Or you have a different mechanism to make sure uh, that eventually um, these two copies have the same information. Uh, a longer story. But uh, the easy answer is, well, you have to write it to all of them. And then you don't gain anything because you have to write. Uh, you change block one, you have to write it on each of the disks. And then basically the write performance is similar to, to having it only on one disk. Yeah? There's no advantage. Yeah, with respect to writing, there's no performance improvement. With respect to reading, there is a huge performance improvement. Yeah? Um, yeah, move marker, I'm always confused here a little bit. Um, what the heck, I oh, know I have to go back. So, will this lecture be in an in exam as theoretical questions? Huh? Um, I'm not really sure what you mean here, but um, so the, um, the exam corresponds basically to what we do in the lab and the assignments. Yeah, that's very close to what we do there. So um, they give you a good, good intuition and idea, like this LMAP and both, many other lectures do it uh, same way. So basically we, we have this um, assignments, and we talk about that on Friday in the lab. And if you are able to solve them independently, then you will be able to solve the exam. Uh, that's basically my message here. What does rate five achieve more than rate four? Yeah, the right um, uh, load is distributed over the different um, disks. Um, that, that also means that uh, the amount of writes that happen on the disk um, are, are scattered over the different disks and that may um, also have an effect on the um, uh, on the lifetime of such a device. Yeah, the, of, the more often you write, the, the, um, the higher the probability that a, a disk breaks down. And like that, you have a distribution over the different um, disks. Mm. Is random access time the reason for defragmenting disks? Defragmenting is a different story. Uh, I would like to postpone that because we will look at that um, next week, probably, or the week afterwards. I will say a little bit about that. I'd like to postpone that. How does storage management differ across different devices like computer? Pooh, well, that's a short question that has, I mean, all kinds of differences depending on how the operating system is implemented, the type of storage medium that's used, database systems do it differently, many, many differences. So. Um, we just look at the general threats here and the techniques that um, are known to work well. How to protect the force disk in RAID 4? How to protect the RAID force disk? I'm not sure what you mean by protect here. Um, again, this is more like a theoretical level in the, in, in the sense don't use it. Use RAID 5. And um, so you, you, you don't want to... So basically, again, so what you see here is that whenever you change a block, it's two disks that have to be touched for writing. Yeah. So whenever you change any of the blocks, it's either one of the three here. So it's the probability of one over three, one third probability that one of the that the one of those disks is touched on the right. However, it's the probability of one that this is touched. Yeah. For every write, you will be touching this disk. But for every write, only one of the three disks is touched. So the write load um, changes, is, is unevenly distributed over the different disks. Huh? And that's changed here. Uh, here you have it distributed evenly across the different disks. That's the major idea of RAID 5. How to protect the force disk in RAID 4. I mean, there's no special protection um, you do for that. Yeah, you don't use RAID 4, you, you do RAID 5. Um, let's delete that one. What about file system access on the shown 
please explain. Okay, let's go to file system first on the pyramid. Yeah, <clears throat> file system access. If you access a file system, that means that part of the data that resides on disk gets copied into main memory. Yeah? So you have some portion here, a couple of pages that sit on your disk or flash drive or the hard disk, whatever. So I, I mostly use disk. When I say disk, I may either mean flash or hard disk. Yeah? An alternative could be that you have two different layers. You, there, I mean, there, there are many arguments for saying, okay, I depict a flash layer that's one layer of my storage, and then there's another disk layer, hard disk layer underneath. That's another way of doing that. I just simplify that into one layer here. So if you um, do a file system access, in terms of reading, you copy stuff here into main memory. Yeah, You do a copy, at least parts of the file have to be copied into main memory. Um, often all of the file is read into main memory, copied into main memory. If you change anything, like with your Word document, let's say, you change anything, then you change it in main memory. Eventually you save it. What, what does save mean? You push it down again to disk. Yeah? So overwrite the old version with the stuff you have in main memory. That's um, loading and um, saving data in that regard. Yeah? That was that question. Um, bam. Any question? Are you sure? Yes. Could you please explain parity? <clears throat> so the idea of parity um, is simply like this is a block of data. Yeah, this is four kilobytes. So all these block sets say four kilobytes, so any multiple of um, of bytes. Yeah? You can do that with a single byte. Yeah. If, um, this is, if you don't understand uh, how XOR works, just play with that. Um, there's some extra data in the Python script, and then you see the magic of how this works. So basically, uh, what I'm doing is I compute a bitwise XOR, a bitwise XOR. So every bit is looked at. Yeah? If you have uh, one XOR, one is zero. Yeah? One XOR, zero is one. Zero XOR, um, one is um, one. Zero XOR, zero is zero. Yeah? That, that's the matrix of a logical XOR. And you do that bitwise. For every bit, you compute that in those blocks. Yeah? So basically, then you define that your stripe parity is this bitwise um, B1 XOR, B2 XOR, B3. For that, you get a new block, this parity, and that you store here on this additional disk. And now the, 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 the art here is that basically whatever disk you lose, so if any of those disks fails, you can uh, reconstruct, reconstruct each and every block that lived on those disks through XOR again. Yeah? So if you lose whatever this disk, let's say, and you want to reconstruct, reconstruct block 9, you simply read block 7, bitwise XOR uh, block 8, bitwise XOR stripe 3 parity. Well, and that yields block 9. XOR magic. Huh? And that is how uh, you compute parity. So these parity, there are different types of parity information. XOR is uh, the easiest um, you can do. Yeah. Um, that was that one. So general question, what is the difference between a database and a file system? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's an evergreen. <clears throat> database system allows you to store and query fine granular data as of the relational model. Yeah? So if you don't know what the relational model is, what um, entity relationship modeling is, as I said last time, that's really crucial to understanding this. Yeah? Um, Phi system uh, deals with larger blocks of data, binary blobs of data that are not, not necessarily fine granular, typically megabyte size. Images, for instance, yeah? images you, you take with your camera, yeah? you you put them in some byte stream on your file system. And basically, it's a key value mapping. So you have this path on your file system that maps to a certain byte sequence. That's all what your file system does. And uh, what a database system does goes so much more beyond that. Uh, uh, when it comes to querying, when it comes to synchronizing, when it comes to making sure that concurrent uh, actions on the storage don't bring you in trouble. Yeah? All the asset properties, transactional properties, uh, a zillion times beyond uh, what file systems can do. 
Yeah, there are good uses cases for file systems. Um, sometimes you don't need a database system, but often there are good use cases for database systems. Yeah? So it's important to understand why you need a file system and you need a database system. But capability-wise, uh, mm -hmm. database system and a file system is a uh, huge difference in, in, in capabilities. Okay, with that, let's call it a day. That's it from my side for today. Thanks for your attendance. Um, we will continue in the lab on Friday that will be held on Discord. Friday, uh, I think it's 12.15 where we do this um, lab. And we basically, you will work on the assignments and, and small teams. We will uh, help you and support you when you have questions. So it's much more than a tutorial. I think it's uh, paramount to understanding the material. You have to play with the material, work with the material. The next lecture will happen then next Wednesday same time uh, slot and then we will be looking at data layouts and what that and what data layouts um, have to do with data efficiency till then see you bye bye stay safe <laughs>